we took this up a few <laughs> a few months ago and um, we talked about the individual unique person of the universe the God man the man Christ Jesus who was uh, perfectly able to represent God perfectly able to represent man put his hand on man's shoulder put his man hand on God's shoulder and pulled the two of us together and uh, we we took that whole aspect up of that unique individual of the universe and the purpose for which he came we talked about how that Jesus and the Christ had come to deal with the sin issue when Adam uh, disobeyed God rebelled against God uh, God had warned them in the day that you eat of the fruit thereof you will surely die die and it's it's a double death it's a spiritual death and then the outworking of that spiritual death was physical death so we went through all of that and talked about what Jesus was here to do and how he was here to do it and we started to go through this process in order to understand and discover where Jesus went for the three days and three nights after his death um, we took up um, the underworld and we started to talk about the five different compartments that are underneath the earth we talked about in the Old Testament uh, that they were only aware originally in the Old Testament of two places they knew that the body went to the grave but they weren't sure but they knew the spirit went underneath the earth but it went somewhere else they called it Shoal uh, the place for departed spirits and they didn't understand how it worked Not, nobody did until Jesus came along when Jesus came along of course Jesus being who he was and understanding all things give us insight into an understanding of the underworld and of course after that the different uh, authors of the epistles uh, elaborated on that as they were led by the Spirit of God we talked about the grave this is where the physical body goes and this was the Old Testament reality still is today your physical body when it dies when your spirit is separate from your body it goes to the grave and in the Old Testament the spirit went to the underworld and it went to this bigger region here that we called Abraham's bosom and there was an upper and a lower region and we took this up over in Luke the 16th chapter when Jesus taught a particular instance where two people two individuals a rich man and Lazarus went uh, to the underworld at death and it described that one of them was in torment and one of them was in comfort and there was a chasm between them and they couldn't cross one to the other although they could see each other one was being comforted and the other was in torment we talked about in that place they still were able to see and talk they still had intellect they still had feelings and emotions and so on and so forth even though they had been separate from their physical body they still had form and shape and they still had uh, the faculty of of being an individual and we took that whole thing up the, and then the last time we were together we took up this region here called Tartarus Peter mentions this particular um, location called Tartarus and Tartarus is a place for fallen angels that left their first estate and went after the daughters of men and we took that whole instance up last week in Genesis the sixth chapter and then we went through Job and different instances and we talked about the sons of God these angels how that in Jude they said they were uh, locked up in chains until the day of judgment so we talked about them last week uh, in a place called Tartarus I want to deal with this morning if I may and maybe move on through it I want to talk about the abyss or the pit this other region that is underneath the earth and uh, this is the fifth region the first one being the grave the second one being Abraham's bosom upper and lower regions the third being or the fourth being Tartarus and the fifth being um, the abyss or abusus and um, so over here in the book of Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 9 it says wherefore God has all, had highly exalted him speaking of Jesus and given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth so again the scripture informing us and revealing to us that there are indeed things under the earth and it says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and again this is why we're talking about the underworld because these three regions exist those things in heaven those things on earth and those that things that are under the earth and um, over in Matthew in the 12th chapter Jesus taught about devils or demons now let me explain these individuals or these characters the word demon 
means is the word disembodied spirit disembodied which implies if it's called disembodied it implies it used to have a body at one stage and it was it, it, it lost it and um, these are not angels uh, angels never anywhere in scripture ever seek to possess a body in fact we talked last week how angels can actually manifest in a body how that the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 how you can entertain angels unawares you wouldn't even know you were dealing with them we talked about instances where they showed up for Elijah and and made him a meal or they showed up for Gideon and give him instructions or they show up for Joshua uh, before he went on the battlefield before Jericho angels have showed up many times in physical form and you would never know the difference um, and nowhere in the scripture does it say that angels ever seek to possess a body because they can manifest in one however demons on the other hand or devils are called disembodied spirits um, I, where, where were they and when did they have a body well different people and commentators um, are, are of the opinion that these were the creatures that S Lucifer ran when he governed a pre-Adamic race long before Adam showed up when Lucifer ran the earth uh, before he had his demise he had kingdoms on the earth over which he governed and ruled and when he was cast out of heaven because of his pride and his arrogance to think he was equal with or better than God uh, you can never be any greater than your master so when your master gets punished everything underneath it gets punished too and so we believe that that's where the first ice age or the ice age as you and I or science would know comes from where God flooded the earth and then turned the lights out and we take the story up then in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3 and the spirit of God brooded over the waters of the earth and so on and so forth and so whatever these creatures were they were obviously in physical they had physical form but when Lucifer became Satan or fallen and the earth was judged these creatures became disembodied now they never left the earth they never left the sphere of the earth and they weren't designed for anything else obviously and they weren't redeemable because there was no redemption for them however they stayed here in the sphere of what we call the earth or the the the, the planet here and these are disembodied spirit um, they are in in, um, in the Hebrew language the, the word for them is satyr s-a-t-i-r which means goat or goat like or hairy one or gargoyle uh, would be another understanding you would have of it uh, or uh, I think well, a more modern reflection of it would be a gremlin that type of a little entity um, and so these creatures do exist in the Old Testament they didn't understand them in the Old Testament they saw activity but they didn't understand what it was again people didn't understand these things until Jesus showed up Jesus then gave clarity they knew there were devils they knew the devils possessed people and controlled people but the Old Testament saints didn't know how to deal with them at all at, at any time for any reason they just didn't know what what they were they didn't understand the spirit world again they only understood that when you die your body goes to the grave and your spirit goes somewhere else obviously underneath the earth but they didn't understand anything more than that that was the full capacity of their revelation Jesus comes along and Jesus starts to explain some of these things that are going on underneath the earth and he starts to explain about devils and demons and um, Jesus makes this statement here when he's teaching he says and when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man this was one of the terminologies they had uh, in the Old Testament unclean spirit or devil or demon and um, Beelzebub was the prince of devils and they accused Jesus of being Beelzebub casting out devils by being the prince of devils and Jesus talks about that and we'll get to it in a minute it says when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none and then he said I will return into my house obviously which was the individual that he was in from whence I came out and when he is come he findeth it empty swept and garnished 
Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they entered in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Jesus here is talking about devils or demons, and he said when they go out of a man, obviously he's talking about them having possessed a man. Again, being disembodied, they seek to possess a body. And these creatures, uh, obviously they had a body at one stage. They gratified or satisfied their passions through a physical body. So in order for them to fulfill their desire or want or need, they seek to possess a body to carry out their desire through. So as disembodied spirits, they look to enter one. Um, does somebody want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18? Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Um, they didn't know very much about that world and what went on in it. But in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, um, Moses, in given instruction, warns the children of Israel about meeting the nations round about and not to get involved in or indulge with the things that they do because of the influence of devils upon these nations and 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 their uh, and what they did it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 uh, sorry chapter 18 verse 8 somebody want to I'll tell you it's probably 8 or 9 no, next one. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. Keep going. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination. Uh, you see that? Divination. I just leave it at that. Here's Moses is warning them, the nation of Israel, be, uh, uh, before they enter into the land that he promised them, that there's going to be nations round about them. And they're into all sorts of witchcraft and divination and necromancy, which is calling up the dead, uh, talking with familiar spirits, uh, interpreting omens, and all sorts of supernatural activity. And he said, when you, when you get among these people, don't deal with this. Don't touch this arena. This arena you know nothing about. You have no idea what's going on. And I want you to leave it alone completely. It's demonic. And they didn't understand it. And that's why he tells them, just steer clear of the whole thing. Steer clear of this type of supernatural Activity And there's always a tendency to draw to it. There's always a tendency when somebody can tell you, you know, um, something about your life or about your past or whatever, you think, you know, there's, you know, maybe you can tell me about my future. And I think when we took up guidance at the beginning of this year, we talked about how so many people look for uh, an advantage in life by looking for, uh, you know, fortune teller or some tarot cards or something, uh, or a Ouija board to give them some advantage in life. And we shouldn't look there, we shouldn't go there, uh, because we're entertaining a world of the supernatural which is demonic. Um, they didn't understand this back then, so much so that um, when they got among nations that practiced this type of supernatural uh, uh, witchcraft, God commanded that they destroy them. Um, in First uh, Samuel, the fifteenth chapter, First Samuel fifteen. Excuse me, First Samuel fifteen. Let me just get there in case I'm. God spoke to Saul, King Saul, who was the first king, and they were going into a particular region, and he commanded Saul, as he went there, to take the army and to kill the people that he was about to encounter. The whole lot. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 3, if somebody wants to read that for me. Okay. 
So Saul is given an instruction here. It sounds just so cruel. It sounds just so, oh my goodness, why would you do this? Why would you kill everything? Why would you kill the men? I can understand killing the men and the women maybe. Uh, but then the children and the suckling and then the animals, for goodness sake, chase after the cat, chase after the cow, kill everything, kill the whole lot and, and be done with it. And it was because they were entering in among a nation that dealt with this type of divination, supernatural activity, witchcraft, necromancy, and so on and so forth. And they didn't understand how they, they, what they were messing with and how it transmitted from one to the other. And so when you got among people like this, you had all sorts of debauchery, bestiality, incest, all sorts of activity that were... Uh, passions and pleasures that were that were uh, perverted um, and they didn't understand why people would would get so low or go so low to do stuff like that and and God basically said look you don't know what's going on you've no idea what you're dealing with so all I want you to do is don't go in there and 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 entertain them just go in and kill everything kill the animals kill the children because everything's been affected demonically and I want you to kill everything. There's another verse also over in the 22nd chapter of Samuel. Samuel chapter 22. Um, and again, this is another crowd of people. And Saul likewise again is given command to deal with uh, this particular crowd of people. Um, somebody want to read at verse 19. Okay, they killed everything. And again, it seems like, oh my goodness, why would God command such uh, an act? It's because of demonology it's because of devils it's because of this activity that the people in the old testament didn't understand again there's nothing we there, there is no instance of a deliverance in the old testament it's not mentioned the only one we come across is over in first uh, samuel chapter 16 this is the story of david saul this particular king that was told to go out and kill all these uh, uh, tribes and and these peoples and um, there was a time when he wouldn't do what God told him to do and God lifted the uh, anointing that was upon him as king and because he wouldn't do what God was telling him and God put that anointing on another individual how many of you know who the other individual was David, David. he put that anointing on David so Saul was now without the presence of God's Holy Spirit and, and and you needed an anointing to do things in the Old Testament the three offices that were anointed in the Old Testament was the prophet the priest and the king and what an anointing meant was was a supernatural endowment to empower or enable somebody to do something that they couldn't ordinarily do and so to be the king of Israel you had to have an anointing but this particular King Saul wouldn't work with God disobeyed God and he was told to kill everybody at one stage, and he didn't. He kept the king, and he kept animals, and so on and so forth. And God said, I can't work with you, pal. I told you what to do. So it happened twice, and God said, okay, I'm done with you. I have someone else. And so he took the anointing off of Saul, and he put it upon a young shepherd boy called David, who didn't for the next 13 to 17 years become king. However, the anointing now came on David, and it wasn't on Saul. So Saul's now the king without the anointing, and he ends up tormented. And of course, torment is a spiritual thing, and it comes from that arena of the demonic. And so in 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, it talks here about Saul and David, and again, these demonic or evil spirits. So does somebody want to read verses 14? Um, it's uh, 14 through what, read 14 through 23 if you would um, if you have a good version it would be great <laughs> now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and the evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him Saul's servants then said to him 
the whole now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit of God is on you that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me now a man who can play you well and bring you to me. And when the young man said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse. That, but, but, yeah, hard word. He walked around. Who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and handsome man, and the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son, David, who is with the flock. Yeah, yeah. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a jug of wine and a young goat and sent them to Saul by David and his, his, David his son. And David came to Saul and attended him. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So Saul sent to, Je Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David now stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So it came about when yep. ever the evil spirit of God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. So... Again, because of their lack of understanding, as this has been written, they think that the evil spirit is sent from God. And he hasn't been sent from God. As it says there in verse 14, And the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. God didn't send the evil spirit. There's the causative and the permissive tense. God didn't cause an evil spirit to come, but he permitted it. He stepped back and he took his spirit from Saul and allowed that to happen because the guy got into that arena himself. And the guy was tormented, so tormented that the only time he ever got relief was when David would come into his presence and take a harp and start singing songs unto the Lord and created a different atmosphere. And when the atmosphere was changed, the devil left, the spirits left, the tormentors left him. Very important issue and very something that we need to understand about praise and creating the right atmosphere. Uh, God inhabits the praises. praises of his people, Psalm 22 and, two, and 3 says. God inhabits the praise of his people. So you create the environment and set the atmosphere and it's amazing uh, how you can change what's going on even in, in, in an environment just by bringing praise and worship and, and acclamation uh, to God. And so this is what happened. And when David would come along and play the harp and sing songs, the devil, the, the devil that was tormenting um, Saul would leave. But uh, when David stopped playing and packed up his harp and, and his songbook and, and headed off, uh, it wasn't too long before the guy was tormented again. And again, it was tormented by these uh, evil or familiar spirits. There's many different instances of this in the Word of God, but there was no clarification as to what was going on, who they were, where they came from, other than the effects that they had upon people uh, to cause them to become debauched or depraved um, or very wicked or very tormented and depressed. Uh, and so we see, that we see their action, but they didn't understand what was, what was happening. So, um, look over in uh, the ninth chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. And nobody ever dealt with these creatures until Jesus came along. When Jesus came along, um, he dealt with the issue, and, and it amazed people. There is no record in the Old Testament of anyone ever being, having been delivered on, until Jesus came along, being delivered from these entities. Um, normally the, 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 uh, the condition, uh, a lot of times, and you often thought it was harsh, and that's where somebody was taken out and stoned to death. Uh, uh, normally it was for sexual perverseness more often than not, but even down to rebellion and so on and so forth. And sometimes you would look at the scriptures and think, oh my goodness, that's a very harsh punishment for that. But again, these entities, and because people did not know what they were or how they operated, only that they did operate and cause 
uh, they were anti-God, they were um, evil, they were fearful and fearsome. And so some of the practices that were uh, carried out in the Old Testament, the punishment for them was just to kill the person. It just seemed the easiest way to deal with it because you couldn't deliver the person. And not that everybody was possessed, but then you didn't know who was and you didn't know who wasn't because sometimes the act was, uh, you know, man's, but the other times it was because they were influenced, tormented, oppressed or possessed by these creatures. And so it just seemed a very harsh punishment, but nobody had ever seen anybody delivered from devils until Jesus showed up. So over in, Acts, in, in Matthew, the ninth chapter, there's a verse of scripture here in verse 32. Um, if somebody wants to read 32 through 34. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitude marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast us out devils to the prince of the devils. So they brought somebody to him. They brought somebody, they used to bring all the sick to Jesus. And they brought a particular individual that was struck with dumbness. And the scriptures go on here to tell us that this man was possessed with the devil. And Jesus cast the devil out. And the comment of the people was, we have never seen this ever happen in Israel. We've never seen this happen. This, this uh, is, is new to us, to see somebody with such authority and somebody with such power um, now, there were people who claimed to be exorcists, as you, you, you know that story over in the book of Acts in chapter 19, where the sons of Sceva tried to cast out a devil uh, by the name of, or by the name of uh, Jesus, whom uh, God preached, God proclaimed. And so they tried to cast the devil out of him, and you know the story, how that um, the, the devils came up out of him and, and beat the the, the, the seven sons and stripped them naked and sent them off down the street on their merry way. And the apostles, on the other hand, they were able to deal with them because of Jesus. But Jesus was the only one that was able to deal with these entities. And it was unseen in Israel up until this time. Go with me to chapter 12. Because as you read there in verse 34, the Pharisees were of the conclusion that the reason he was able to cast out devils was because he was the prince of devils. And so to come to this conclusion, in the 12th chapter of Matthew, further on down, look with me in verse, um, somebody read verse uh, 24 for me, uh, 24 and 25. Read the next two verses for me as well, if you would. And if Satan cast out Satan, he that divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by the Elzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. Just read the next verse. Again, Jesus is talking here because they accuse him. They said, because they've never seen it before. And they said, well, we know how he does it. We know how he casts out devils. He casts out devils because he's the prince of them. So they're all under his authority. That's how he does it. And Jesus says, nah, you're missing it, for goodness sake. You, you, if, if a kingdom just you know, casts out its, its kingdom, then it's going to crumble. It's going to destroy itself. He says, no, the only way, we, what's going on here is a stronger kingdom has showed up, and that stronger kingdom is dealing with the weaker kingdom, and that's what's going on. So Jesus wasn't casting out devils because he was the prince of devils. He was casting out devils because a stronger kingdom had been manifest in their midst. 
Again, these Pharisees and scribes, he goes on to say, by whom then do you claim that you're cast in the mount? Because they made those claims, but they actually weren't cast in the mount. They made claims, you know, we're going to pray for you, or you're going to do this, or you bring an offering, or bring a bowl, or bring whatever, and you're free. But he said, you really can't say that, because nobody could. Nobody had that power to do that, because nobody possessed the strength of that kingdom that Jesus was now manifesting. He came to manifest that kingdom. They hadn't experienced it yet. Look in Luke, if you would. We will get to the... We will get to the slide. I know just we're on a rabbit trail now, so. Um, Luke chapter 10, please. Everybody still with me? All right. Luke chapter 10. Does somebody want to read verses 17 through 20? 17 through 20. In Latin, in Latin. If you have a Latin version of the Bible, no, go ahead. So here's Jesus and the 70, and he'd given them authority to deal with these entities. So these guys are really, I mean, having a, an amazing time doing what nobody else could ever have done and never done before that, and that was cast out devils. So people weren't just coming with ailments, but people who were under the torment, oppression, or depression uh, of demonic entities were now, instead of being stoned or um, cast out uh, or discarded from, from society, they were now being liberated and delivered and set free. And again, this was the sign of the kingdom of God. Yes, sir? Uh, I have to admit, all this sounds like kind of way out there today. Are, are exorcists true? Because I know people who have demons in them, but they act like they have demons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we need a, of course, the person, I guess, if they believe in Jesus, they rely on him to cast them out. How do you get them to that point? How do you get who to that uh, point? I, first of all, the question is, do you think exorcism really works? Yes. Really Are there devils? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I won't even go into the stories, but yes, they are, and they do exist. Um, and they do come out, and they, they will conform, and they do obey. They know. They actually know. They, they already know. Well, there's a person with the demons in him, the, the dumb man as described it here. He didn't do anything. He just had them cast out. Yep. They, no, you don't have to have an epiphany. You just have to have somebody with the authority to cast it out. But the thing about casting them out... Uh, without getting into exorcism and the whole lot, and it's an interesting question, so I appreciate it. Um, when you cast them out, it's not enough to just leave them out. Uh, this is what he says here, and this is the instance that he says here, here. He said, when you cast them out, and they're cast out into dry places, now they don't know what to do with themselves, so they look to come back to where they came out of. When they come back to where they come out of, they find that the place was cleaned. That when they got delivered, that that God just cleaned the whole place up. The thing about it is if you don't have something in there, like the Word of God and, an, and a revelation and an understanding of what has happened to you, what has been done for you, and fill the void and don't replace it with something, then the entity comes back in because that's where your weakness was or that's where the habit was or the, you open the door for them to come in at some stage and now you're back thinking I'm free and you start playing around again or messing around again in that arena. Not alone does he come back, but he brings seven others because he thinks, hey, you know what, uh, the place is cleaned and garnished and spotless, I might as well come on back, and a whole bunch move in. And um, so 
this idea of bringing deliverance to people as, as smart and all as it is and wonderful as it can be, it's very, very important that whoever has been set free needs to position themselves in a place to be filled with knowledge and understanding and revelation of what has happened, how it happened, and, um, and who did it for them. So. Well, this is what we're saying. It's, it's important for you. Um, it, it doesn't say that they have to be saved. It just, it just says that if, if, it, if they come back and it's empty and there's nothing in there and there's no understanding or they don't perceive what happened to them and why they were down the path that they were or out of control like they were or tormented like they were, it'll come back. And if you don't have enough to stay free or now understand what to do to continue to be free, then then they come back. But ultimately, salvation is, is the best. Luz? But obviously, a born again person cannot be possessed of the devil. Correct. Absolutely. Born again, you're not going to have devil. No. Not at all. So, if, if you're, would you agree that if you're praying to get rid of like, the spirit of anger, that it would make sense to pray for the spirit of opposite to come in? Say that once more. No. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Go, go to Galatians chapter 5. Are you there, Sharon? No, I'm going to Galatians Galatians chapter 5. God help you if you're arguing with Lucy, you're going to lose. <laughs> That's my experience. <laughs> and I try to cast her out, but she doesn't. She casts me out. <laughs> um, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. Do you want to read that for me, Sharon? Read the very beginning of that again. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go back and read that again. Now. Go on. Works of the flesh. Oh, sorry, read that again for me out loud. Read it out loud. The works of the flesh. Some people just think that they can cast the works of the flesh out. And they accuse it of being a devil. The spirit of anger, the spirit of adultery, the spirit of variance, the spirit of hatred, the spirit of... There, you can't cast your flesh out. They are works of the flesh. And a lot of times, what you need to do with anger is stop being angry. And what you need to do with adultery is stop thinking that way or exposing yourself that way. And a lot of times what we do is we... we have this and the church do as a whole so I'm glad you brought it up Sharon but the church as a whole have this idea that the devil's responsible for everything and he's not I think sometimes we blame the devil for stuff and he stands outside the door thinking oh my goodness they're blaming me again for everything and there are works of the flesh that are not works of the devil they're just works of the unregenerated flesh and they're not spirits and we sometimes think and blame spiritual entity so therefore we end up every time we pray we're casting the devil of this and the devil of adultery and the devil of pornography and the devil of um, greed and the devil of and it's not the devil at all these are works of the flesh now can the devil entertain you in that arena yes he can I wasn't saying But 
So why, why did you call it, why do you call it the spirit of anger? I'm not saying that I'm not saying that he doesn't, but is, is it would it be wrong then for the body of Christ if you're not sure to adopt the attitude that just by praying the spirit of anger or the spirit of adultery would sort of put the onus over on that thing to leave you alone or for you to take control of your own thoughts and I agree. The devil, all right, the devil will entertain your weakness if you go down long enough. But the demon possession is not something that happens quickly. It takes a lot of time to get there. But when you get there, but a lot of times the body of Christ have this perception that if they just pray in the name of Jesus and speak to a particular devil or spirit, blaming them for it. The devil made me do it. The devil did not make you do it. Uh, because you are held accountable to God for it, therefore you're responsible. And that was why I was suggesting that I think the person can be saved because then they have the power of the Holy Spirit to help them be more victorious. And I would think it would be a, a good idea for somebody to be saved. I think they'd be more victorious and spiritual. All right, let, let, let me, without go, going down, in, in, you, you raised your hand, you have something. You're always in control of you. You're always in control of your thoughts. You're responsible for them. How can God hold your? Anger, greed, passion. You're always responsible for. Why do you think they put you to jail for it? You can't sit in front of the judge and say, "Excuse me, the devil made me do it." I mean, honestly, he did. He'll say, "I don't care who made you do it. You're going to." Always. No. No, you, what you're saying now is a chemical thing. No, sin is not chemical. Sin is spiritual. Well, I think on that point, what, uh, I, was, I was thinking too, I think too often in my own family, we call it mental illness. There, there are. There are. Um, there are hormonal discrepancy sometimes periodically that lean to or cause a person to um, gravitate to certain feelings or emotions and again emotions are spiritual and and your feelings again as we're doing this whole series on emotions you can actually take your emotions in control you can harness them and you can bring them into line there are chemical imbalances so don't get me wrong however that is not the norm many times and many times that's used as an excuse um, for where we're at and I'm not again a, I'm not condemning people who have such things or experiences but uh, we, we have to stop re or believing that um, my situation is a chemical imbalance only or um, I'm not in control of or um, I, I, I'm not convinced of that at all. I think the scriptures tell us that we can take captive every thought and bring it into obedience and bring it into line with the word of God. If, it, if, it, if you can't, then it shouldn't say that. But wouldn't that be in a different world? I mean, no. That's, that's what I understand that. When it, we, we, are, we are Christians. This is what we're talking about this morning. I'm not talking to non-Christians. I'm talking to us as Christians. You cannot be possessed with the devil as a believer. You can't. A believer, his, his spirit is regenerated by the Spirit of God and it is sealed by the Spirit of God and the human newborn spirit cannot sin. It is not possessed with and is sealed until the day you meet Jesus face to face. So uh, a, a human being that is born of the Spirit of God cannot be possessed with the devil. Can you be tormented? Yes. Can you be oppressed? Yes. And in fact, if you play around with it long enough, you'll end up, uh, you'll shorten your life. You'll die. 
Uh, there is called a sin unto death, and I'll explain that. Um, there are certain sins that uh, a Christian can practice that uh, go to First John. Go to First John with me, just for a second. Let me show you something. Well, In 2020? I, I can. I've encountered them. I, I've encountered demonic entities in individuals. Um, and it's, it's quite... Um, uh, it's quite strange. It's, it's quite a strange thing to have. In, but here's the deal. We can sit here this morning talking about all of that stuff. And we have this tendency to want to get in. Tell me all the stories. And through the years, although I've encountered them and experienced them and, I've, and they've spoken, I've stayed away from telling people about it because people love to hear. Well, tell me another story. Oh, really? Is that right? I don't want to even go there. I guess my question is, is where do you go from being possessed to suffering? To what? To, to personal will, choice. personal choice. Like, I'm angry. I've got to defeat this anger with the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, you have, the, you have the ability to control all your thoughts. As a, as a Christian, you have a knowledge and understanding. But even as a Christian, if you will not comply with, renew your mind with the Word of God, because that's still part of the Christian life. This idea that I'm born again, nothing can touch me. You can be born again and still act carnally and as a result shorten your life. I, I want you to read a, a portion of Scripture in... First John, the fifth chapter, and does somebody want to read verse 18? First John 5 and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Go on. I'm so sorry. I, that's my, my fault again. I, I failed. Verse 16. Verse <laughs> 16? Yeah. 1 John 5, 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give. Will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should... Make request for this. Keep going. Okay. All unrighteousness is sin, and there's a sin not leading to death. Okay. Uh, I won't get into it this morning, but there is a sin on to death that Christian Christians commit. And you can get born again, get forgiven, get sealed, um, and and then carry on in habits or stuff that you know to be wrong and leave yourself open and vulnerable and the thing about it is it's a sin unto death you will die because of it you will exit early because of it and there are sins that people commit and we as brothers and sisters pray for one another as the bible says over in james chapter 5 that if any sin among you are sick let him call for the elders and let him lay hands on the sick and the, and the, and the prayer of a righteous man avail it much and god will raise them up and forgive any on confessed sin that's for carnal believers are you all familiar with that verse uh, go to first go to james chapter 5 somebody please everybody still with me this morning yes. all right nope that's physical death these are believers there's a brother that commits a sin and it's a sin on to death. And I, he says, I, I'm, I'm telling you, don't pray for them. Leave them alone. Just don't pray for them. James, which chapter? James chapter 5. Now, the book of James is written to um, a, a bunch of believers that are totally carnal. They're just, they're carnal. They're just, they're, they're saved, but they're acting like, I mean, that's it. They're, they're in, but they're not, they don't, they, anyway, there's a, the whole book's about carnal, carnality. But he makes this 
And I'll read it from verse 13. It says, first, or sorry, James 5, 7, uh, 13. Is there any among you afflicted? Or the word there afflicted means under pressure, okay? Or in a tight corner is what it means. Is there any among you? Now, these are carnal believers. The whole book is about carnality. Is there any among you that is afflicted? Let him pray. Is there any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and it shall be, sorry, and if he had committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you be, may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You've all heard that. You've all read that many times. He's talking to carnal baby Christians. And basically he's saying when you're under pressure, here's what you do. Pray. Stop asking everybody else to pull you out of the hole that you found yourself in. Pray yourself. But having said that, if you find yourself sick and you can't deal with it, then get people that are more spiritual than you. Go get the elders of the church because you're acting like a child and you need somebody more mature to deal with what's going on. Let them anoint you with oil. The reason you need anointing with oil is because you don't have enough faith, so you need something tangible to see, to look at and believe in. Oh, there's something about the oil. If you just put the oil on me, I'll get healed. You need it. If, if that's where you're at in your faith walk, where you need somebody to put oil on you or somebody to give you communion or somebody to give you something, that's where you're at. And he says, because they're carnal, let somebody who's more spiritual pray with you, anoint you with oil to show you, to remind you, to confirm to you that you have the Holy Spirit. And if you put faith in what's going on or the oil that you're given, you, you'll get healed. And if you have any unconfessed sin, it'll be forgiven. God understands you're in your carnality. But there is another type of sin that a believer who should know better continues in, and when they continue in it, he says, stop praying for them. Stop praying for them and let them die. Because that's the better thing for them. It's called a sin on to death. I'm not going to teach about it, but I'm stuck in this rabbit hole for a minute. Go with me to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Exactly, Michelle. Let them, look at, if they're not going to do what they know to do, just go ahead and leave them there where they're at and let them just die because that's where they're going. That's the path that even as a Christian, they're, they, they're carrying on and, and they'll probably die because of it. Uh, I'm going to read this verse of scripture here to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a guy that is committing incest with his stepmother, okay? And... Paul writes to the Corinthian church. Uh, these are all Gentile believers. And he reads, in Rome, I'm going to read from verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 5. There is reportedly, sorry, there is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named even among the unbelievers or among the Gentiles, that one should sleep with or have sex with his father's wife. And you are puffed up, and you are not rather mourned or sorrowful, that he which has done this deed might be taken away from among you. There's somebody in the congregation that lives like this, and, it, and, and you don't just know it, but everybody on the street knows it. Everybody and their dog knows it. And, and the people in the, in the heathen don't even do this, for goodness sake. They say it's wrong, but you've got this character in the church living this way. Everybody knows it. It's reported commonly, and you aren't doing anything about it. In fact, you just sort of carry on. So he goes over in verse 3. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one, where? Hand them over. Deliver such a one on to Satan for the destruction of what? His flesh, not his spirit. For the destruction of his flesh, 
that what? Save. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Well, this, is a this is a believer. But he's, he's in the church and he won't repent and nobody's doing anything about it and everybody knows what's going on and even the Gentiles know what's going on and they would, I mean, even to them it's wrong. So they're looking in at the church thinking, my goodness, he's a Christian and, and everybody knows and they just leave him alone. Paul says, no, no leave him alone. Obviously, uh, put him out. Put him out of there because he's out of line, he's not repentant, he won't change and you just need to do something. Put him out, hand him over to Satan because if he's wanting to walk in the flesh, because that's what he's doing now, then let him because Satan will destroy him eventually. Now, obviously, they did put him out because over in 2 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians, and they had put this guy out of the church, out of the community. How many of you know that there is a, a covering in, in the church? A lot of people think, well, I don't need to go to church. I actually do. You say, I don't need anywhere. I just have the Bible and Jesus. No, you don't have the Bible and Jesus. He, he plants you in the church where there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to grow you up and mature you up and to enable and empower you to serve and develop character. And that's what the local church is for. And so any believer who thinks that they don't have to belong to or be part of or commune in some type of community, Christian community, is wrong. Um, or they need a pastor or oversight or somebody to be accountable to and answerable to. You're wrong. You have to. Um, it's scriptural. It's, it's part of the body of Christ, and we're all, we're all part of it. Um, and people don't realize that when they're part of a church, there is a covering. Um, it's the safest place on the earth. And Jesus made the statement in John the 16th chapter when he was talking to who do men say that I the son of man am and then when Peter says you are the Christ and he says Peter well done upon that revelation I will build my church and the gates of hell have no power if you stay in that covering. It's a place that the devil can't destroy. I mean the only thing right now and I don't care what the stock exchange or, or, or political stuff is the kingdom of God is still advancing and nothing the devil does will ever stop it. It's, it's the safest place, it's the best place you can ever be, is in under the covering of God. And so this guy was put out from under that covering, they put him out of the church to carry on doing what he was doing in the flesh. And so the Bible says, here's what happened. Second Corinthians, and this is chapter 2. And Paul now writes, and here's what he writes. He says, this is, again, some time later. It says, verse 5, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may be overwhelmed, sorry, that I may overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is the punishment which was inflicted of many, so that now, contrawise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with much sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For I forgive, sorry, for if I forgive anything to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. Least Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. He says here, Paul writes back, in the first Corinthians he wrote to them and said, I heard what everybody's talking about, what's going on in the church, you need to stop it, and you need to deal with it. And if this individual hasn't repented, hasn't stopped, even though he's a Christian, your best bet is to put him out. He'll die early. His soul will be saved, but he's sinning his sin on to death. Just hand him over to Satan. They did. They obviously put him out. And as a result of him being put out, whatever happened to him, he came back. And he was sorry. And he stopped. And Paul writes to them now and says, Here, guys, now I hear that this guy's come back. And here's the deal. You've you got to take him back. If he's sorry and if he's repented, then you forgive him. 
and I forgive him. I'm, I'm not there. He said, but if I can forgive him, and you should be able to forgive him because we understand that God forgives us. And I'll tell you why you need to do it as well. Because Satan will take advantage of your unforgiveness and he'll destroy the whole lot of you with your bitterness and your, your, your judgmentalisms. He says, don't let the devil get an advantage of us by making us be unforgiving. The guy is sorry, bring him back in under the covering of the church. That's this individual. So, um, can you sin, sin on to death and get out of God's will and, and exit the world early as a believer? Absolutely. Yes, you can. However, the demonic activity, and, and, and demons can torment you, and demons can oppress you as a believer. Yes, they can. But can they possess you? No. But what would happen if you started to yield in that direction? You'd, you'd, you'd commit a sin on to death. You'd get out. There's no one particular sin. I'll take it up as a study one day. But you get out so far out into, into our field, even as a Christian, that Satan will just take you out ASAP as soon as he can. He'll take you out. You'll exit. Your body will go to the grave because you were walking in the flesh, but your spirit is sealed by the Spirit of God and go to heaven. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's there's two uh, incidents that obviously that had happened already because Jesus said I saw it, he saw it happen. You don't think he was reflecting on what no, there is a portion over in Revelation chapter twelve where it talks about war in in heaven and Satan uh, and his angels war with Gabriel, uh, Michael and and his angels, um, and that's obviously people refer to that as that battle where a third of the angels, because it mentions a third of the angels falling uh, with with Satan at that time. Um, it's it's not definitive that that's exactly what happened. Um, because the Bible says there in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 thereabouts, that Satan was cast out of heaven. Um, if you read the book of Job, you'll find out that Satan has access to heaven. And um, and when it says he was cast out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12, it says he knows his days are short, and as a result of that and not being allowed back into heaven, he goes after the children of Israel who need protection and they run into the mountains of <laughs> Edom, Ammon, and Moab. All right. But they run into those mountains and hide because the devil goes after them. Um, so in Genesis, in, sorry, in Revelation 12, when it mentions that particular instance, it also tells us and defines the fact that the devil is cast out, he's not going back, and therefore he goes after the children of Israel, and we end up with the tribulation, the great tribulation period, and the end. Satan being cast out in Luke 10, where Jesus refers to it there, as he, and the, the disciples come back and say, you know, we saw the de devil's cast out. He goes, no, 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 I was there when Satan was cast out of heaven. And um, that, I, I presume, was a, a pre-Adamic fall where he saw his demise uh, altogether. Um, but we see that even after his fall, his demise, because of Adam, Adam gave him access to the presence of God. Adam, one of Adam's privileges in the garden was that he was able to come into the presence of God. And Adam was able to uh, do that. And so Satan... Uh, we find him in the book of Job standing in front of God's throne in heaven. He said, well, how did he get in there? I mean, I thought he was chucked out um, earlier on because of his pride. He was, but because Adam had access and Adam had yielded to Satan, whoever you bow your knee to becomes your master. So the privileges that Adam had had was given to Lucifer or Satan, and he ends up in the presence of God and has been there 
because of what because of Adam's privilege. But then in the end times, he's cast out again. Yes, sir. Locked out for good. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. That's again another rabbit hole, and we we get down to it more. How are we all doing so far? All right. Don't. don't Say again. Let's go over all this again. God, I only got one one slide done this morning. Say what? A good friend in high school, and who died about 35 years ago, of alcoholism. And and standing outside when they bring the body out, another friend of mine told me that he was running from God. He was from a very Christian family. He had been called to preach. He, this guy who died told this other friend he had been called to preach, and he was just running. People do it all the time. You have to choose to walk in the spirit. You have a choice: walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. You can, as a Christian, you can still walk in the flesh, um, uh, but you can also choose to walk in the spirit. Whereas unbelievers really don't have a choice; they they just walk in the flesh uh, uh, until you get born again and indwelt with the spirit of God. Then you can walk in your newborn spirit. So, um, yeah, it is. It's. For me, the church really need an optical correction on on, the whole, on demonology, um, because um, we say a lot of things and we don't have a lot of. Um, they sound good and they sound great, but they're not actually biblically based, and it's very very hard to have faith in something that the scriptures don't tell you you have or can do. Yes, ma'am. They make we we'll get to it next week, but the, when we do read it, what we're going to find out is that there's a, a thousand, there's a legion, um, or six thousand. Uh, there's a legion of devils in this particular individual, and he was super strong and super whatever, and people were afraid of him. He lived naked and and out of community. Um, when Jesus came along and pulled the boat up, this guy comes running up, and then instead of everybody's probably thinking, "Oh my God, we're done," here he comes. But he falls at Jesus' feet because he and he realizes who because he he recognizes who Jesus is, and he says, "Are you here to torment us before the time?" So they know their destiny; they know where they're going. So he says, "Are you here to torment us before the time?" And don't cast us down into the abyss. They ask him, "Don't cast us into abusos because this is where demons go. This is where devils are." held in the underworld don't send us there in fact would you just send us to the pigs now the pigs were non kosherist for Jews so they didn't so and they were so to speak an animal that the Jews didn't deal with and so they said just give us another give us something else to possess that has flesh because they're disembodied entities so they, they said well look we're going to cast us out of this guy there's a whole herd of pigs over there, so don't send us down to abuse us, just send us over there. He said, okay. So he sent them all over there, and then they all jumped into the, into the thing, and they all ended up in abuse us, if you understand what I'm saying. He just basically, but he was showing us what happens is these creatures want to possess something. And if it wasn't a human, they'll go into an animal or something else. And so they're just looking to gratify their desire through physical flesh. And that's what they do. So um, they knew where they were going and they, they thought he was there to send them there before the appointed time. And they knew where it was they were going to, which was Abusos, the, the abyss or the bottomless pit. Pardon? Some of them are, but some of them are here. They're in the room, actually. This room has, has angels and devils in it. So... Um, Yes, sir. Well, we've been doing it all morning, so another, another rabbit hole. Another rabbit hole. Nothing strange. Go ahead.
things that come at us. They're spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And you've done a great session on, on the whole armor of God and, and knowing that. So uh, they can't embody us, but they can still attack us at times. Absolutely. Certain, certain seasons of our life. Yeah. And that's what we have to use the armor of God to know that. Yeah, they can torment us. They can oppress us. And, and they can endeavor to afflict us. And, and it just it's, it's our own awareness or lack of or ignorance to what's going on and um, give no place to the devil he says i mean the devil can take advantage of your ignorance um, and uh, and yet people do uh, we we can be tormented we can be oppressed um, from time to time and um, i often use the terminology when we talk about corinthians about uh, take captive every thought um, can you stop the birds flying over your head? No. No, you can't. When you walk out there today, there's nothing you can do to stop the birds flying over your head. Would you agree? But would you be very surprised if somebody was walking around with a nest built in their hair and birds living in it? You would. You'd say, well, hold on a wee minute. And you have control over that. But you have no control of the birds flying over your head, but you certainly do control whether they nest in your hair. And you have no control over the thoughts that come, but you certainly have control as to whether they stay. All right? And one of the ways of thoughts staying with you, because um, thoughts come. You, uh, thought is not a sin. Okay? Um, go to... Um, Matthew the 6th chapter we all have thoughts but the Bible tells us to take, take control of them take captive every thought bring it into obedience to the knowledge of the word of God in, in Matthew chapter 6 somebody read verse 31 Read the beginning of it again. Pardon? Read the beginning of it again. Therefore, take no thought, saying, Stop. Read it again. Therefore, take no thought. Next word. Say. Read it again. Therefore, take no thought, saying, Go back. Read it again. Uh, Therefore, take no thought, saying, Stop. Therefore, take no thought. How do you take a thought? Therefore, take no thought saying. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What am I going to put on? How are we going to manage? Now, the thought came, but you've taken the thought and you give life to the thought. How? Speaking it. You give life to it with words. Well, I'm worried. I'm afraid of my life. I'm telling you, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, it never works for me. I mean, it always happens. I mean, they had it. My grandmother had it. My great-great-grandmother had it. And I'd probably get it too. Stop it. Stop taking thoughts. Do you have thoughts? Yes. I get them all the time. You get them. And some of them are godly and some of them are not godly. But when they travel over like a bird flying over your head, you don't let that thing nest in your head by saying it. Because once you start saying it, you're inviting it to nest in your head. And you start to give life to it. I've often told the story, and, and Lucy's heard me many times, and I, I remember a time way back when I was studying in in the little house we had in, up in the back bedroom, I had a symptom that showed up in my life. Um, an ailment, a symptom, I don't know what it was, but it was sore, it was, it, was, um, it was frightening to me at the time. And the thought was, if this continues the way it is, I won't be able to do what I need to do as far as the call of God is concerned in my life. It would totally incapacitate me or take me out early. And I felt it. It was physical. And I remember reading that verse of Scripture. It's why I, I, it's something I, at the time I was, I, it, it was 
I was very aware of it, but I said nothing to Lucy. And Lucy used to sometimes say to me, you're doing okay, darling. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And she'd say, you're not fine. And I'd say, I am. And she said, well, but you're not. And anyway, and I'd say, oh, no, I'm doing fine. And she says, what? And I would never, and it was because I had prayed about it and, and I was going through the scriptures one day and I came across this. Take no thought, saying. Now, I know I had ailments and I had symptoms and this was for me, so I'm not saying this for you. You have to get a revelation of stuff yourself. You can't live on all other people's revelation, okay? You, I can tell you something. That's why I don't talk about some stuff because people say, oh, well, that's, that's what I'll do. Do what God has, what you have a revelation of. But I, I felt that God spoke to me through that particular verse and said, it's a thought right now, because, but don't give it life. Therefore, take no thought saying. So for the next 18 months, I never said anything. Although there were times that I, I had, it was obvious that I was feeling something. And I would never, and to this very day, I have never shared the thought. I've never given it life, and it never manifested. It never could. After the eighteen months, just it just went away. It never, it never tormented me again, ever. It's never come back, and I never give it life. And some things in your life, you just know you don't need to take every thought and start speaking it. it you don't need to be worried. That's what worry is. Worry is giving life to thoughts that are not filled with faith. That's all it is. That's all worry is. It's just talking about stuff that hasn't even happened. It's fear. And you give life to that fear. And so your best bet is just keep your mouth shut. Um, and, and anyway, that, that's... Why do we go down that rabbit hole? Uh, I, just, <laughs> I just thought, talking about all this, we yeah. back to the Armour of God series. That yes, was, absolutely. Very important for us as believers, even though we can't yeah. be body by spirit, but sometimes we have to fight yeah. the good fight. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, you do. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, and, and, and about the armor of God, now you know why and so on and so forth. And some people just think all we need to do is get people born again and hey, this is it, it's all done. That's only the beginning. That's only the start. And without maturing and growing up, we'll never be able to be what we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do, have what we're supposed to have and, and reveal to the world what has happened to us and, and who lives in us and through us. Um, and, and that's, for me, that's really where the body of Christ needs a, a whole optic change. We need, to, we need to grow up and start being the powerful entity that we are in Christ Jesus.